Okay, Accounting 1 students, today we are going to advance from Chapter 1 to Chapter 2. So we're going to start with a little transaction worksheet or tabular summary, which we did in Chapter 1. We had, I uh, showed you Jill Jones, Tammy Two Books, Problem 15A. So I'm going to go through six transactions, all of which we've encountered before. So letter A is going to be transfer of funds from personal to business account. And let's say that's $10,000. That was the first transaction we did with Jill Jones, if you recall. That would go in the capital column. And we refer to that as an investment. You recall that there was four things that could happen in this column. There would be investments that increase capital, revenue that increases capital, drawing that decreases capital, and expenses that decrease capital. So there's our first transaction. We got 10,000 on both sides of the equation. And let's say the second transaction, we buy $500 worth of supplies on account. So you have more supplies. And you didn't pay for them. It's on accounts. So what does that mean? That means you owe the money, so you increase accounts payable. All right. Next on the hit parade, fees earned from a cash client. These are our favorite kind of people, right? You do the work, you bill the client, bill, charge your invoice, and you get the money. So Jill Jones, if you recall, she had a $2,500 increase in cash and a simultaneous increase in capital and that's revenue. We gave it a name. We call it fees earned. Okay. Let's see. Next, paid monthly rent. P A I D. That's a dirty word. It's a dirty four letter word. We're going to subtract 950 from the cash account. Say that's the monthly rent. And then we took it off the capital column. And we gave it a creative name like rent expense cost of doing business yeah okay next Atlantic City withdrawals we took $1,800 out of our cash account headed down to Atlantic City and lost all the money playing blackjack so there's no such thing as gambling expense that would be drawing personal use company funds, yeah? All right, paid supplier on account. Once again, that four letter word can only mean your favorite thing is slip sliding away. So let's say you paid $200 on account. Who did we pay? We paid the creditors. The creditors typically gonna be in this column here, accounts payable. And there you have it, six transactions, simple worksheet, okay. Now, unfortunately, you can't use this technique in the real world because you know, we got two assets here. You could have 30 assets. We have one liability. You could have 40 liabilities. Capital, there'd be zillions of transactions in here. It's not workable. So cutting edge technology, what happened? Back in approximately the year 1500, a Francescan monk by the name of Luca Pacioli devised what is known as the double entry accounting system. So Lucas said, well, you know what? I want to keep track of all this stuff here, just like we did on this worksheet. But instead of going plus minus, I'm going to put the increases on one side of what you're going to come to know and love as an account. I'm going to put the increases on the left side. I'm going to put the decreases on the right side. And if the increases outweigh the decreases, I would have a positive balance, which you're going to come to recognize as a debit balance. So let's see. Let's take this first transaction, letter A. That's a $10,000 increase in cash. Now, Luca decided, I'm going to put the increases on this side. How did he decide that? Maybe he spun a wine bottle and it pointed to the left. He said, all right. I'll put the increases on the left side. Now, it sounds crazy. It sounds arbitrary. Um, 
But once that was decided, you're going to see all the rules are going to fall like dominoes. So let's see. I'm going to put the increases on the left side of the account. So that means the $10,000 is going to go on this side. Now I'm going to come down to the bottom here. So I ordinarily draw these accounts as I'm going along in a face-to-face -face class, but this is not a face-to-face -face class, so here we go. I want to put letter A over here, and I'm skipping a step right now, which I'm going to come back to in a few minutes. I put the 10000 over there. Now, in addition to putting the increases on the left side, Luca named the left side the debit side. So if you put 10000 on this left side, you have debited the account. And then you say to yourself, self, did my cash balance just increase or decrease? You're thinking, that's too easy a question. I'm not going to answer, right? My cash balance just increased. Mm -hmm. So if I want to increase an account balance, an asset like cash, I have to debit the account. That's the abbreviation DR. You're thinking, where's the R in debit? Well, obviously no R in debit, but the Latin word contained in R. Okay, so increases in cash and happily all other assets accounts will be reflected by a debit, which we're going to show on the left side of our account. All right. Now the right side of the account is going to be the credit side. So we know that a debit increases an asset. Conversely, we know a credit will decrease an asset and all other assets. Now, Luca had a very simple rule. He said that the debits must be equal to the credits. So for every debit or debit, there must be equal and opposite credit or credits. So that means that if I'm going to debit the cash account, which increases it, I'm going to need to credit some other account. And what other account is that going to be? Well, let's look at our worksheet. It's going to be the capital account. So we'll set up an account for capital as well. And what are these accounts doing? They're keeping track of the activity of this little company. So let's see, letter A is going to go over here in the capital account. So you can see that if you're on the left side of the equation with an asset, a debit increases. But if you're on the right side of the equation, a credit increases the account balance. So we have positive 10K in both accounts. You want to increase capital? You need to credit the account. If you want to decrease capital, you would debit the account. So now we have a couple of rules. All right, we move right along. Let's go to the second transaction. Purchase supplies on account. Well, supplies just increased, yeah? And we know supplies is an asset. So that's one of the things that you need to carry over from chapter one. You need to know what an asset is. Recognize it. Cash, accounts, receivable, supplies, prepaids, property plan, equipment, etc. All right. So supplies increased. That's an asset. We're going to have to put the 500 on the debit side. I'm skipping a step, but I'll come back to it. 500 over here. Now we need a credit. We've got to credit something. Well, we know what the credit's going to be because we knew that from our little worksheet, yeah? So we need to increase accounts payable. You owe more money now. Anything ending in the word payable is going to be a liability, yeah? So come down here. I'll drop that 500 over here in the account for accounts payable. Now we just discovered another set of rules. Accounts payable just went up, yeah? So a credit will increase accounts payable and happily all other liability accounts will be increased with a credit. And the converse is true with that. It's going to reduce a liability account. Alrighty then. So now we've derived some rules here for debiting and crediting, all right?
let's go to the next transaction. Letter C, that was our cash client. We love these people, right? So the 2,500 was an increase in cash. I'll bring that down over here. Now, it would make sense, be logical at this point, to put the 2,500 over here because your capital is going up. And this is where it gets a little bit more complicated. We're not going to put this transaction in the capital account. We're going to create a separate account, fees earned, for revenue. Why are we doing this? Why don't we just put the 2,500 in here? Well, think about it. A real company with thousands of transactions, this account would have many thousand transactions in it. Now, if you wanted at any point in time to know what the fees earned is, you'd have to go sorting through all these credits in this account. But we want to keep track of all that stuff during the year. So to keep track of revenue, we'll set up a separate account, fees earned. To keep track of drawing, we'll set up a separate account, drawing and rent expense. Now, these two, drawing we know and expenses we know, decrease capital. Could have put them in here. Again, think about real life. Thousands of transactions. You got all kind, you got drawing, you got all kinds of expense activity would go in this account. In order to figure out, well, what's my rent expense for the month, six months, nine months, or a year? You'd have to go through all those transactions, sort through them to figure out, well, what I spent on rent expense? Because there's all the other expenses might be in here as well. That's a bad idea. So you know what? Separate account for each and every expense, okay? Separate account for drawing. Separate account for revenue. And you might have more than one revenue or income account. You might have a couple of these. You can have a bunch of these expenses and probably one drawing account. So there you have, that's why these are called temporary accounts, because we could have put the information in here, but we didn't because we wanted to track all this stuff throughout the year to assist us or facilitate the preparation of financial statements. Okay. That is the reason for that. Now let's go back and look at the remaining three transactions. D starts with that dirty word, right? Paid, that can only mean one thing, you have less cash. So I'm gonna reduce cash, put that over here, 950. And instead of putting that decrease in the capital account, I'm gonna reflect that as an increase in rent expense. Okay, now let me do a little So if you want to increase a revenue account, what do you do? You credit the account. If you want to increase an expense account, what do you do? You debit the account. And the converse is true. Okay. Let's see. What's next on the head parade? We are up to, I believe, transaction E. What happened? That was the ill-fated trip to Atlantic City. So you want to decrease cash. Yeah? $1,800. Come down here. Let's put that over here. It's a credit. And the offset is going to be drawing. Once again, you could have put that over here, but no, we want to, we want to keep track of drawing throughout the year. So we'll have this account. And we'll be able to figure out what was our drawing at any point in time. We would just look at the balance in the account to figure that out. All right, so what's the rule for drawing? If you want to increase drawing, you need a debit. Now at this point, we have all of the rules, okay? 
let's see, what's our last transaction? Paid supplier, so reduce cash by 200. That's going to go over here. And we paid the supplier, so what does that mean? That means we owe less money now, yeah? So we know this from Chapter 1. We owe less money. How do you reflect that in a liability account? You need a debit. So that's going to go over here. It's $200. Okay. So now I have put all six transactions in these accounts. Okay. So the book of accounts is called the ledger. Okay. That's where you would find all of the accounts the ledger. Now what's the step that I skipped? Okay. Well before you put these numbers in the accounts, you write them down. Of course in a computerized setting you're typing it in or in some other way reflecting these transactions. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go to a finished worksheet and let's see what is it we're supposed to do before we put these numbers in the accounts. We're supposed to do this. We're supposed to record the transactions in a journal. Now, what's, what shows up in this journal should not be a surprise because we looked at it from the standpoint of a worksheet and we looked at it from the standpoint of its impact on the ledger accounts. So what was the first transaction? That was investment of personal funds in the business. So we said, Let, I want to debit cash. So here's my transaction. Now I have A, B, C, D, but that would be dates in the real world. So we might be 9, 15, 20. I want to debit cash. So what do I do? Write down cash. My journal is going to have a debit and credit column. So I drop that in the debit column. And I want to credit capital. Is my first transaction. I wrote it down in a journal. Then after you write it down in a journal, of course we're doing this manually, you take that number and you pull it down over here, drop it into the account. That's called posting. Taking a transaction from the journal and reflecting it in the ledger. Okay, posting. Now, if you figure this out, if you're able to figure this out here, in other words, look at a transaction and come up with a journal entry for it, the next step, the posting step, is highly mechanical, right? Because this tells you exactly what you're going to do. It says, let me debit cash, put it here. Let me credit capital. Whoops. Put it there. All right. So that transaction, that's how it shows up. What was the second transaction? Purchase supplies on account. Okay, we have more supplies. We know supplies is an asset. I want to increase it, so I debit supplies. Accounts payable, I owe more money now. It's a liability. I want to increase the amount I owe. Credit accounts payable. Third transaction, I got more cash. Cash, and this is how you do this. You ask yourself, which accounts are affected by a transaction? That's step A. Now, we should know this from chapter one. So there was a bunch of transactions we looked at. And you have to be able to recognize what's going on when you see a narrative description of a transaction. So this one, how, what's the narrative? Paid supplier on account, right? <clears throat> So you would say, okay, I know the two accounts affected. One of them, I'm sorry, this is purchase supplies on it. One of them is supplies, and the other one is accounts payable. So I identified the two accounts, and we knew this again from chapter one. So the next question is, what is the nature of the account or the classification?
In other words, which one of these six items are we talking about? Well, for supplies, you say, well, I know what supplies is. Supplies is an asset. Accounts payable, oh, that must be a liability. Anything ending in payable is going to be a liability. All right. Then you go to the final step. And again, this is all chapter one stuff, right? You go to the final step, and we want to know, is the account increasing or decreasing? That's the step here, again, chapter one. So when I purchase supplies on account, I have more supplies, yeah? And I owe more money. Now you take this information, this chapter one stuff over here, and then you look at your rules. I derive the rules. I want to increase supplies, which is an asset. I go to my rules and I say, okay, good. I want to debit supplies. So one, two, three, go to the rules pick the rule that you need, in this case, to increase an asset. Go to the rules and pick the rule you need to increase a liability. So those are the two rules that we used in this transaction right here. That's how you do it. All right, in the early going, if you do this for a while, it kind of becomes second nature. Uh, but that won't happen for a while, so. We have to do this in the old one, two, three, four, and there's my journal entry. All right. What happened next? Well, we know what happened next. We had our cash client. We had more cash. So we said cash, asset, increase, debit, fees earned. We have more fees earned. Every time you bill, invoice, or charge a client, whether they pay you or not, you have fees earned, revenue increasing with a credit, rent expense, Cost of doing business, yeah. More of it, debit the expense account. Less cash, asset, credit cash. Drawing, We've got to fix that or I won't be able to sleep tonight. Drawing, more of it when you went to Atlantic City. Hopefully you learned your lesson. Debit drawing, I want to increase it. Cash. Asset, decrease, credit. Accounts payable. Liability. How do I decrease a liability? A debit. Once again, cash, asset, decrease, credit. And there you have it. So, before you put the numbers in these accounts, you first write down the transaction in a journal. And this is where the... the thinking comes into play. I mean, you have to figure out all this stuff here to be able to record a transaction. And then you punch it into the rules to get your journal entry. And once you have the journal entry, very mechanical, right? Oh, this journal entry B says there's a debit to supplies. So what do you do? Go down here, and you just drop the 500 into the supplies account. All right. So, that's how it works. First, record the transaction in a journal, then post the transaction to the ledger. Now, this, in the real world, of course, is going to be done electronically. So, st sometimes students say, well, why don't we just, you know, use the computer to do this? Well, in order to use computer software, you need to know what's going on. I could give you my tax accounting software, does that mean you're going to be able to do a corporate tax return? Of course not. So you need to know the tax laws. So here we need to know how does accounting work in a manual setting, and then it'll show up in a computerized setting. It may not look exactly the same, but exactly the same stuff is happening. So let's see. In a computerized setting, let's say you recorded all these transactions properly, yeah? The mechanical thing is the posting, right? Posting. 
And after we've done all that, we have a ledger. Let's see if we can get it all on one page here. Here's our ledger. Now, account balances. I have the account balances in these little green rectangles. So if you add up the debits, that's 12,500, and you add up the credits, that's 2950. We got more, we have more debits than credits. We have a debit balance. The difference between those two totals, yeah. It's normal to have a debit balance in cash. Does that make sense? It's normal, in other words, to have more deposits than you have withdrawals from your cash account. Could you be overdrawn? The answer is yes. It's possible you could have a credit balance in cash. It is normal to have a debit balance. And in fact, anything that increases an account balance would be the normal balance. So take a liability. Okay. Every time you owe more money, you want to increase the liability. Why would you have a debit balance? You should never have a debit balance in a liability, okay? unless you overpaid somebody, maybe. So here we go. Let's look at our ledger. Let's look at this. Here's our balance. 9,500 cash. Supplies only had one transaction in there. 500 accounts payable went from 5, 3, down to 300. And the rest of these accounts all have just the one transaction in them, and therefore that one transaction represents the balance. So let's say we did this. We recorded the transactions in a journal, which requires chapter one knowledge and then conversion to a journal entry. We posted to the accounts and then determined the balances in each of the accounts which in this case is very simple, the exception of cash. Then if we wrote down those balances, so what is this? This is a listing of the accounts in our ledger and the corresponding balances. The observance student will note the total of the assets is equal to the total of the liabilities. Remember Luca's rule, right? For every debit or debits, there has to be equal credit or credit. So our books are in balance. This is it's called the trial balance. And it's as of a specific point in time. This is not a financial statement, but it's the raw materials for a financial statement. We have to go to chapter three and chapter four before we can figure out how to use this new stuff here to prepare financial statements, which we did in chapter one. Okay, so in the old days, let's go back. Let's say it's 1951. Are there personal computers? No, that's a dream at this point. So a small, medium business, they don't have computers. They don't have computer software. They're doing this manually. How many accounts do we have here? Seven? Imagine 75 accounts with not six transactions like we had over here, but 600 transactions. So this trial balance back in 1951 is going to be a very long list of accounts, yeah? And there's going to be a lot of transactions and a lot of calculating in terms of, you know, what are the balances? Now imagine you did this manually. Is it possible that you could have made a mistake? And of course the answer is be very possible. In fact, it'd be likely. So that's why this is called a trial balance, because you know the first go, you might add all this stuff up and it doesn't equal. And then you'd have to go back to figure out, well, what did I do wrong? What did I do wrong to cause this to be out of balance? Now, the computer software that I use and Professor Weinstein uses, this is always going to balance, okay? And that's probably true of a lot of software, accounting software. So let's go back. Let's make believe we recorded these in a computerized setting. 
we came up with the proper journal entries. And there they are. What are the chances <clears throat> that our computer software is going to put this 10,000 in the wrong account? No chance. What's the chance it's going to put the 10,000 on the wrong side of the account? Not going to happen. All right. So if you have this journal entry correct, it will every single time find the account that you affected. It's going to put the transaction on the correct side of the account. That's going to happen a million times, and a million times it's going to happen correctly. And the same is true for all of these transactions. They'll always go to the correct account, and they'll always impact the account properly, in other words, debit or credit. What are the chances that the computer software that you're using will incorrectly add up the total of the debits. There's no chance. It's going to add up the debits every single time correctly and the credits every single time correctly. And it's going to calculate the balance every single time correctly. Now, what does this mean? This means the following. If these entries are correct, then everything else that follows will also be correct, which makes the journal entries the most important aspect of chapter two. Get the journal entry right, and the rest of the stuff will fall in line. What's the rest of the stuff? The posting to the ledger and the trial balance. Everything's gonna balance. All right, that's how it works. Now. What do the IT people, they have this little acronym, GAIGO. That means garbage in, garbage out. So you could get all six of these transactions completely wrong, but you have a debit and a credit that's equal. Every single transaction here is incorrect. Is this thing going to balance? Is our trial balance going to balance? it will balance, okay? It'll be completely wrong. Remember, garbage in, garbage out. So once again, reaffirming what? The journal entries are the most important thing. And in a couple of weeks or so, we're gonna have a comprehensive assignment, which is gonna look very much like the so-called homework assignments that I give you. Um, and it's gonna involve the recording of a bunch of transactions. Now these kind of transactions I usually refer to as day-to-day -day, daily recurring transactions that would typically be recorded, but not all the time, by a bookkeeping type person. An accounting person would get involved when we get to chapter three and we do adjusting journal entries. And that's just a generalization, so it's not always true. It depends on how the company is situated, how big the company is, and so forth. So there you have it. All right, so what is our first mission? We want to carefully read chapter two. I'm going to send this little worksheet out to you. And obviously, you can look at the worksheet, and you can watch the screen video. Um, and I would carefully examine this, because this contains, I'm going to say, good 95% of the important subject matter in chapter two. So this is very important. And we got these daily recurring bookkeeping transactions, and we're gonna get more sophisticated and somewhat more complicated when we go forward. We look at adjusting journal entries. So there you have it. I'll send this out to you along with our homework assignment, which you would not be submitting to me. Um, you will submit the so-called comprehensive assignments. That's not going to happen for a few weeks. Do the best you can. And if you have trouble, by all means, you could send me an inquiry with a specific question or questions, and I'll be happy as hell to answer. Okay, so that's all for now. Have fun with this. 
And I'm going to also, by the way, send you problem 15A, the solution of, that's the D-like dry cleaner. So you'll have three of those tabular summaries. You'll have Jill Jones, you'll have Tammy Two Books, and you'll have the D-like dry cleaning cleaners that you can look at, which is going to basically be this stuff all over again, the tabular summary. All right, signing off for now. Have fun.